Chapter 11 In the Coach and Horses Now, in order to clearly understand what had happened in the inn, it is necessary to go back to the moment when Mr. Marvel first came into view of Mr. Huxter's window. At that precise moment, Mr. Cuss and Mr. Bunting were in the parlour. They were seriously investigating the strange occurrences of the morning, and were, with Mr. Hall's permission, making a thorough examination of the invisible man's belongings. Jaffers had partially recovered from his fall, and had gone home in charge of his sympathetic friends. The stranger's scattered garments had been removed by Mrs. Hall, and the room tidied up. And on the table, under the window where the stranger had been wont to work, Cuss had hit almost at once on three big books in manuscript, labelled Diary. Diary, said Cuss, putting the three books on the table. Now, at any rate, we shall learn something. The vicar stood with his hands on the table. Diary, repeated Cuss, sitting down, putting two volumes to support the third, and opening it. Hmm, no name on the fly-leaf. Bother, cipher, and figures. The vicar came round to look over his shoulder. Cuss turned the pages over with a face suddenly disappointed. I'm... Oh dear me, it's all cipher, Bunting. There are no diagrams, asked Mr. Bunting. No illustrations throwing light. See for yourself, said Mr. Cuss. Some of it's mathematical, and some of it's Russian, or some such language, to judge by the letters, and some of it's Greek. Now, the Greek I thought you— Of course, said Mr. Bunting, taking out and wiping his spectacles, and feeling suddenly very uncomfortable, for he had no Greek left in his mind worth talking about. Yes, the Greek, of course, may furnish a clue. I'll find you a place. I'd rather glance through the volumes first, said Mr. Bunting, still wiping. A general impression first, cousin. Then, you know, we can go looking for clues. He coughed, put on his glasses, arranged them fastidiously, coughed again, and wished something would happen to avert the seemingly inevitable exposure. Then he took the volume Cuss handed him in a leisurely manner. And then something did happen. The door opened suddenly. Both gentlemen started violently, looked around, and were relieved to see a sporadically rosy face beneath a furry silk hat. Tap? asked the face, and stood staring. No said both gentlemen at once. "'Over the other side, my man,' said Mr. Bunting. "'And please shut that door,' said Mr. Cuss, irritably. "'All right,' said the intruder, as it seemed in a low voice curiously different from the huskiness of its first inquiry. "'Right you are,' said the intruder in the former voice. Stand clear. And he vanished and closed the door. A sailor, I should judge, said Mr. Bunting. Amusing fellows they are. Stand clear, indeed. A nautical term referring to his getting back out of the room, I suppose. I dare say so, said Cuss. My nerves are all loose today. It made me quite jump the door opening like that. Mr. Bunting smiled as if he had not jumped. And now, he said with a sigh, these books. Someone sniffed as he did so. One thing is indisputable, said Bunting, drawing a chair up next to that of Mr. Cuss. 
There certainly have been very strange things happening at Iping during the last few days. Very strange. I cannot, of course, believe in this absurd invisibility story. It's incredible, said Gus, incredible, but the fact remains that I saw, I certainly saw, right down his sleeve. But did you... Are you sure? Suppose a mirror, for instance. Hallucinations are so easily produced. I don't know if you've ever seen a really good conjurer. I won't argue again, said Cuss. We've thrashed that out, Bunting. And just now there's these books. Ah, here's some of what I take to be Greek. Greek letters, certainly. He pointed to the middle of the page. Mr. Bunting flushed slightly and brought his face nearer, apparently finding some difficulty with his glasses. Suddenly he became aware of a strange feeling at the nape of his neck. He tried to raise his head and encountered an immovable resistance. The feeling was a curious pressure, the grip of a heavy, firm hand, and it bore his chin irresistibly to the table. "'Don't move, little men,' whispered a voice, "'or I'll brain you both.' Mr. Bunting looked into the face of Cuss, close to his own, and each saw a horrified reflection of his own sickly astonishment. "'I am sorry to handle you so roughly,' said the voice, "'but it's unavoidable. "'Since when did you learn to pry into an investigator's private memoranda?' "'said the voice, and two chins struck the table simultaneously, "'and two sets of teeth rattled. "'Since when?' Did you learn to invade the private rooms of a man in misfortune? And the concussion was repeated. Where have they put my clothes? Listen, said the voice. The windows are fastened, and I've taken the key out of the door. I am a fairly strong man, and I have the poker handy, besides being invisible. There's not the slightest doubt that I could kill you both and get away quite easily if I wanted to. Do you understand? Very well. If I let you go, will you promise not to try any nonsense and do what I tell you? The vicar and the doctor looked at one another, and the doctor pulled a face. Yes, said Mr. Bunting, and the doctor repeated it. Then the pressure on the neck relaxed, and the doctor and the vicar sat up, both very red in the face and wriggling their heads. Please keep sitting where you are, said the invisible man. Here's the poker, you see. When I came into this room continued the invisible man, after presenting the poker to the tip of the nose of each of his visitors. I did not expect to find it occupied, and I expected to find, in addition to my books of memoranda, an outfit of clothing. Where is it? No, don't rise. I can see it's gone. Now, just at present, though the days are quite warm enough for an invisible man, to run about stark. The evenings are quite chilly. I want clothing and other accommodation, and I must also have those three books. Chapter 12 The Invisible Man Loses His Temper It is unavoidable that at this point the narrative should break off again for a certain very painful reason that will presently be apparent. While these things were going on in the parlour, 
and while Mr. Huxter was watching Mr. Marvel smoking his pipe against the gate, not a dozen yards away, Mr. Hall and Teddy Henfrey were discussing in a state of cloudy puzzlement the one iping topic. Suddenly there came a violent thud against the door of the parlour, a sharp cry, and then silence. Hello, said Teddy Henfrey. Hello, from the tap. Mr. Hall took things in slowly but surely. That ain't right, he said, and came round from behind the bar towards the parlour door. He and Teddy approached the door together with intent faces. Their eyes considered. Somewhat wrong, said Hall, and Henry nodded agreement. Whiffs of an unpleasant chemical odour met them. There was a muffled sound of conversation, very rapid and subdued. You all right there? asked Hall, rapping. The muttered conversation ceased abruptly. For a moment, silence. Then the conversation was resumed in hissing whispers, then a sharp cry of, No, no you don't. There came a sudden motion and the oversetting of a chair, a brief struggle, silence again. What the deuce? exclaimed Henry sotto voce. You all right there? asked Mr. Hall sharply again. The vicar's voice answered with a curious, jerking intonation. Qu quite right. Please don't interrupt. Odd, said Mr. Henfrey. Odd, said Mr. Hall. Says don't interrupt, said Henfrey. I heard him, said Hall. And a sniff said Henfrey. They remained listening. The conversation was rapid and subdued. I can't, said Mr. Bunting, his voice rising. I tell you, sir, I will not. What was that? asked Henfrey. Says he winnered. Weren't speaking to us, was he? Disgraceful! said Mr. Bunting within. Disgraceful, said Mr. Henry. I heard it distinct. Who's that speaking now? asked Henry. Mr. Cuss, I suppose, said Hall. Can you hear anything? Silence. The sounds within indistinct and perplexing. Sounds like throwing the tablecloth about, said Hall. Mrs. Hall appeared behind the bar. Hall made gestures of silence and invitation. This aroused Mrs. Hall's wifely opposition. What you listening there for, Hall? Ain't you nothing better to do busy day like this? Hall tried to convey everything by grimaces and dumb show, but Mrs. Hall was obdurate. She raised her voice, so Hall and Henfrey, rather crestfallen, tiptoed back to the bar, gesticulating to explain to her. At first she refused to see anything in what they had heard at all. Then she insisted on Hall keeping silence while Henfrey told her his story, she was inclined to think the whole business nonsense. Perhaps they were just moving the furniture about. I heard and say disgraceful. That I did, said Hall. I heard that, Mrs. Hall, said Henfrey. Like as not, began Mrs. Hall. Shh, said Mr. Teddy Henfrey. Didn't I hear the window? What window? asked Mrs. Hall. Parlour window, said Henfrey. 
Everyone stood listening intently. Mrs. Hall's eyes, directed straight before her, saw without seeing the brilliant oblong of the inn door. The road white and vivid, and Huxter's shop front blistering in the June sun. Abruptly Huxter's door opened, and Huxter appeared. Eyes staring with excitement, arms gesticulating. Yap! cried Hunter. Stop thief! and he ran obliquely across the oblong towards the yard gates and vanished. Simultaneously came a tumult from the parlour and the sound of windows being closed. Hall, Henry, and the human contents of the tap rushed out at once pell-mell into the street. They saw someone whisk around the corner towards the road, and Mr. Huxter executing a complicated leap in the air that ended on his face and shoulder. Down the street, people were standing astonished or running towards them. Mr. Huxter was stunned. Henry stopped to discover this, but Hall and the two labourers from the tap rushed at once to the corner, shouting incoherent things, and saw Mr. Marvel vanishing by the corner of the church wall. They appear to have jumped to the impossible conclusion that this was the invisible man suddenly become visible, and set off at once along the lane in pursuit. But Hall had hardly run a dozen yards before he gave a loud shout of astonishment, and went flying headlong sideways, clutching one of the labourers and bringing him to the ground. He had been charged just as one charges a man at football. The second labourer came round in a circle, stared, and conceiving that Hall had tumbled over of his own accord, turned to resume the pursuit, only to be tripped by the ankle just as Huxter had been. Then, as the first labourer struggled to his feet, he was kicked sideways by a blow that might have felled an ox. As he went down, the rush from the direction of the village green came round the corner. The first to appear was the proprietor of the coconut shy, a burly man in blue jersey. He was astonished to see the lane empty save for three men sprawling absurdly on the ground and then something happened to his rearmost foot, and he went headlong and rolled sideways just in time to graze the feet of his brother and partner, following headlong. The two were then kicked, knelt on, fallen over, and cursed by quite a number of over-hasty people. Now, when Hall and Henfrey and the labourers ran out of the house, Mrs. Hall, who had been disciplined by years of experience, remained in the bar next to the till. And suddenly the parlour door was opened and Mr. Cuss appeared, and without glancing at her, rushed at once down the steps round the corner. "'Hold him!' he cried. "'Don't let him drop that parcel.' He knew nothing of the existence of Marvel for the invisible man had handed over the books and bundle in the yard. The face of Mr. Cuss was angry and resolute, but his costume was defective, a sort of limp white kilt that could only have passed muster in Greece. "'Hold him!' he bawled. "'He's got my trousers and every stitch of the vicar's clothes!' "'Tend to him in a minute!' he cried to Henry as he passed the prostrate Huxter, and, coming round the corner to join the tumult, was promptly knocked off his feet into an indecorous sprawl. Somebody in full flight trod heavily on his finger. He yelled, struggled to regain his feet, was knocked against and thrown on all fours again, and became aware that he was involved not in a capture, but a rout. Everyone was running back to the village. He rose again and was hit severely behind the ear. 
he staggered and set off back to the coach and horses forthwith, leaping over the deserted huckster who was now sitting up on his way. Behind him, as he was halfway up the inn steps, he heard a sudden yell of rage rising sharply out of the confusion of cries and a sounding smack in someone's face. He recognized the voice as that of the invisible man, and the note was that of a man suddenly infuriated by a painful blow. In another moment, Mr. Cust was back in the parlour. "'He's coming back, Bunting,' he said, rushing in. "'Save yourself!' Mr. Bunting was standing in the window, engaged in an attempt to clothe himself in the hearth-rug and a West Surrey gazette. "'Who's coming?' he said, so startled that his costume narrowly escaped disintegration. "'Invisible man,' said Cuss, and rushed on to the window. "'We'd better clear out from here. He's fighting mad. Mad!' In another moment he was out in the yard. "'Good heavens!' said Mr. Bunting, hesitating between two horrible alternatives. He heard a frightful struggle in the passage of the inn, and his decision was made. He clambered out of the window, adjusted his costume hastily, and fled up the village as fast as his fat little legs would carry him. From the moment when the invisible man screamed with rage, and Mr. Bunting made his memorable flight up the village, it became impossible to give a consecutive account of affairs in Iping. Possibly the invisible man's original intention was simply to cover Marvel's retreat with the clothes and books. But his temper, at no time very good, seems to have gone completely at some chance blow, and forthwith he set to smiting and overthrowing for the mere satisfaction of hurting. You must figure the street full of running figures, of doors slamming and fights for hiding places. You must figure the tumult suddenly striking on the unstable equilibrium of old Fletcher's planks and two chairs with cataclysmic results. You must figure an appalled couple caught dismally in a swing. And then the whole tumultuous rush has passed, and the Iping Street with its gourds and flags is deserted, save for the still raging unseen, and littered with coconuts, overthrown canvas screens, and the scattered stock in trade of a sweetstuff stall. Everywhere there is a sound of closing shutters and shoving bolts, and the only visible humanity is an occasional flitting eye under a raised eyebrow in the corner of a window-pane. The invisible man amused himself for a little while by breaking all the windows in the coach and horses, and then he thrust a street lamp through the parlour window of Mrs. Gribble. He, it must have been, who cut the telegraph wire to Adderdine just beyond Higgins's cottage on the Adderdine road. And, after that, as his peculiar qualities allowed, he passed out of human perceptions altogether, and he was neither heard, seen, nor felt in Iping any more. He vanished absolutely but it was the best part of two hours before any human being ventured out again into the desolation of an Iping street. Chapter 13 Mr. Marvel Discusses His Resignation When the dust was gathering and Iping was just beginning to peep timorously forth again upon the shattered wreckage of its bank holiday, a short, thick-set man in a shabby silk hat was marching painfully through the twilight behind the beech woods on the road to Bramblehurst. 
he carried three books bound together by some sort of ornamental elastic ligature and a bundle wrapped in a blue tablecloth. His rubicund face expressed consternation and fatigue. He appeared to be in some sort of spasmodic hurry. He was accompanied by a voice other than his own, and ever and again he winced under the touch of unseen hands. "'If you give me the slip again,' said the voice, "'if you attempt to give me the slip again—' "'Lord,' said Mr. Marvel, "'that shoulder's a mass of bruises as it is.' "'On my honour," said the voice, "'I will kill you.' "'I didn't try to give you the slip,' said Marvel, in a voice that was not far remote from tears. "'I swear I didn't. I didn't know the blessed turning, that was all. How the devil was I to know the blessed turning? As it is, I've been knocked about.' "'You'll get knocked about a great deal more if you don't mind,' said the voice, and Mr. Marvel abruptly became silent. He blew out his cheeks, and his eyes were eloquent of despair. "'It's bad enough to let those floundering yokels explode my little secret without your cutting off with my books. "'It's lucky for some of them they cut and ran when they did. "'Here am I. No one knew I was invisible. And now what am I to do?' "'What am I to do?' asked Marvel, sotto voce. "'It's all about. It will be in the papers. "'Everybody will be looking for me, every one on their guard.' "'The voice broke off into vivid curses and ceased. "'The despair of Mr. Marvel's face deepened and his pace slackened. "'Go on,' said the voice. Mr. Marvel's face assumed a greyish tint between the ruddier patches. "'Don't drop those books, stupid,' said the voice sharply, overtaking him. "'The fact is,' said the voice, "'I shall have to make use of you. You're a poor tool, but I must.' "'I'm a miserable tool,' said Marvel. "'You are,' said the voice. "'I'm the worst possible tool you could have,' said Marvel. "'I'm not strong,' he said after a discouraging silence. "'I'm not over-strong,' he repeated. "'No?' "'And my heart's weak. "'That little business, I pulled it through, of course, "'but, bless you, I could have dropped.' Well, I haven't the nerve and strength for the sort of thing you want. I'll stimulate you. I wish you wouldn't. I wouldn't like to mess up your plans, you know, but I might, out of sheer funk and misery. You'd better not, said the voice with quiet emphasis. "'I wish I was dead,' said Marvel. "'He ain't justice,' he said. "'You must admit, it seems to me I've a perfect right.' "'Get on,' said the voice. Mr. Marvel mended his pace, and for a time they went in silence again. "'It's devilish hard,' said Mr. Marvel. This was quite ineffectual. He tried another tack. "'What do I make by it?' he began in again, in a tone of unendurable wrong. "'Oh, shut up!' said the voice, with sudden amazing vigour. "'I'll see to you all right. You do what you're told. You'll do it all right. You're a fool and all that, but you'll do.' I tell you, sir, I'm not the man for it. 
respectfully, but it is so. If you don't shut up, I shall twist your wrist again, said the invisible man. I want to think. Presently two oblongs of yellow light appeared through the trees, and the square tower of a church loomed through the gloaming. "'I shall keep my hand on your shoulder,' said the voice, "'all through the village. "'Go straight through, and try no foolery. "'It'll be the worse for you if you do.' "'I know that,' sighed Mr. Marvel. "'I know all that.' "'The unhappy-looking figure in the obsolete silk hat "'passed up the street of the little village with his burdens.' and vanished into the gathering darkness beyond the lights of the windows. Chapter 14 At Port Stowe Ten o'clock the next morning found Mr. Marvel, unshaven, dirty, and travel-stained, sitting with the books beside him and his hands deep in his pockets, looking very weary, nervous, and uncomfortable, and inflating his cheeks at infrequent intervals, on the bench outside a little inn on the outskirts of Port Stowe. Beside him were the books, but now they were tied with string. The bundle had been abandoned in the pine woods beyond Bramblehurst, in accordance with a change of plans in the invisible man. Mr. Marvel sat on the bench, and although no one took the slightest notice of him, his agitation remained at fever heat. His hands would go ever and again to his various pockets with a curious, nervous fumbling. When he had been sitting for the best part of an hour, however, an elderly mariner, carrying a newspaper, came out of the inn and sat down beside him. "'Pleasant day,' said the mariner. Mr. Marvel glanced about him, with something very like terror. "'Very,' he said. "'Just seasonable weather for the time of year,' said the mariner, taking no denial. "'Quite,' said Mr. Marvel. The mariner produced a toothpick, and— saving his regard, was engrossed thereby for some minutes. His eyes, meanwhile, were at liberty to examine Mr. Marvel's dusty figure and the books beside him. As he had approached Mr. Marvel, he had heard a sound like the dropping of coins into a pocket. He was struck by the contrast of Mr. Marvel's appearance with this sudden suggestion of opulence. Thence his mind wandered back again to a topic that had taken a curiously firm hold of his imagination. "'Books?' he said suddenly, noisily finishing with the toothpick. Mr. Marvel started and looked at them. "'Oh, yes,' he said. "'Yes, they're books.' "'There's some extraordinary things in books,' said the mariner. "'We oh, believe you,' said Mr. Marvel and some extraordinary things out of them, said the mariner. True, likewise, said Mr. Marvel. He eyed his interlocutor and then glanced about him. There's some extraordinary things in newspapers, for example, said the mariner. There are. In this newspaper, said the mariner. Ah. Oh said Mr. Marvel. "'There's a story,' said the mariner, fixing Mr. Marvel with an eye that was firm and deliberate. "'There's a story about an invisible man, for instance.' Mr. Marvel pulled his mouth askew and scratched his cheek and felt his ears glowing. "'What will they be writing next?' he asked faintly. "'Austria or, or America?' Neither, said the mariner, here. 
Lord, said Mr. Marvel, starting. When I say here, said the mariner, to Mr. Marvel's intense relief, I don't, of course, mean here in this place. I mean hereabouts. An invisible man, said Mr. Marvel, and what's he been up to? Everything, said the mariner, controlling Marvel with his eye and then amplifying every blessed thing. I ain't seen a paper these four days, said Marvel. I pings the place he started at, said the mariner. Indeed, said Mr. Marvel. He started there, and where he came from nobody don't seem to know. Here it is, peculiar story from Iping, and it says in this paper that the evidence is extraordinary strong, extraordinary. Lord, said Mr. Marvel, but then it's an extraordinary story. There's a clergyman and a medical gent witnesses saw him all right and proper, at least ways didn't see him. He was staying it as at the coach and horses, and don't no one seem to be aware of his misfortune, aware of his misfortune, it says, until in an altercation at the inn. It says, his bandages on his head was torn off. It was then observed that his head was invisible. Attempts were at once made to secure him, but casting off his garments, it says, he succeeded in escaping, but not until after a desperate struggle, in which he had inflicted serious injuries, it says, on our worthy and able constable, Mr. J. A. Jaffers. Pretty straight story, eh? Names and everything. Lord, said Mr. Marvel, looking nervously about him, trying to count the money in his pockets by his unaided sense of touch, and full of a strange and novel idea. It sounds most astonishing. Don't it? Extraordinary, I call it. Never heard tell of invisible men before, I haven't, but nowadays one hears such a lot of extraordinary things that that all he did? asked Marvel, trying to seem at his ease. It's enough, ain't it? said the mariner. Didn't go back by any chance? asked Marvel. Just escaped, and that's all, eh? All? said the mariner. Why, ain't it enough? Quite enough, said Marvel. I should think it was enough, said the mariner. I should think it was enough. He didn't have any pals. It don't say he had any pals, does it? Asked Mr. Marvel, anxious. Ain't one of a sort enough for you? Asked the mariner. No, thank heaven, as one say. He didn't. He nodded his head slowly. It makes me regular uncomfortable, the bare thought of that chap running about the country. He is at present at large, and from certain evidence it is supposed that he has taken, took, I suppose they mean, the road to Port Stowe. You see, we're right in it. None of your American wanderers this time, and just think of the things he might do. Where'd you be if he took a drop over and above and had a fancy to go for you? Supposing he wants to rob, who can prevent him? He can trespass, he can burgle, he could walk through the cordon of a policeman as easy as me, or you could give the slip to a blind man. Easier. For these here blind chaps hear uncommon sharp, I'm told and wherever there was liquor he fancied. He's got a tremendous advantage, certainly, said Mr. Marvel. And, well, you're right, said the mariner. He has. 
All of this time Mr. Marvel had been glancing about him intently, listening for faint footfalls, trying to detect imperceptible movements. He seemed on the point of some great resolution. He coughed behind his hand. He looked about him again, listened, bent towards the mariner, and lowered his voice. The fact of it is, I happen to know just a thing or two about this invisible man from private sources. Oh, said the mariner, interested. You? Yes, said Mr. Marvel. Me. Indeed, said the mariner, and may I ask? You will be astonished, said Mr. Marvel behind his hand. It's tremendous. Indeed, said the mariner. The fact is, began Mr. Marvel eagerly in a confidential undertone. Suddenly his expression changed marvellously. Ow! he said. He rose stiffly in his seat. His face was eloquent of physical suffering. Wow! he said. What's up? said the mariner, concerned. Toothache, said Mr. Marvel, and put his hand to his ear. He caught hold of his books. I must be getting on, I think. He edged in a curious way along the seat away from his interlocutor. But you was just a gonna tell me about this here invisible man, protested the mariner. Mr. Marvel seemed to consult with himself. Hoax, said a voice. It's a hoax, said Mr. Marvel. But it's in the paper, said the mariner. Hoax all the same, said Marvel. I know the chap that started the lie. There ain't no invisible man whatsoever. Blimey! But how about this paper? Do you mean to say? Not a word of it, said Marvel stoutly. The mariner stared, paper in hand. Mr. Marvel jerkily faced about. Wait a bit, said the mariner, rising and speaking slowly. Do you mean to say... I do, said Mr. Marvel. Then why'd you let me go on and tell you all this blasted stuff, then? What do you mean by letting a man make a fool of himself like that for, Hey. Mr. Marvel blew out his cheeks. The mariner was suddenly very red indeed. He clenched his hands. I've oh, been talking here this ten minutes, he said. And you, you little pot-bellied, leathery-faced son of an old boot, couldn't have the elementary manners. Don't you come bandying words with me, said Mr. Marvel. Bandying words, I've a jolly good mind. Come up, said a voice, and Mr. Marvel was suddenly whirled about and started marching off in a curious spasmodic manner. You'd better move on, said the mariner. Who's moving on, said Mr. Marvel. He was receding obliquely with a curious hurrying gait with occasional violent jerks forward. Somewhere along the road he began a muttered monologue, protests and recriminations. Silly devil, said the mariner, legs wide apart, elbows akimbo, watching the receding figure. I'll show you, you silly ass, hoaxing me. It's here, on the paper. Mr. Marvel retorted incoherently, and, receding, was hidden by a bend in the road, but the mariner still stood magnificent in the midst of the way, until the approach of a butcher's cart dislodged him. Then he turned himself towards Portstow. Full of extraordinary asses, he said softly to himself, just take me down a bit, that was his silly game. It's on the paper. 
and there was another extraordinary thing he was presently to hear that had happened quite close to him and that was a vision of a fistful of money no less travelling without visible agency along by the wall at the corner of st michael's lane a brother mariner had seen this wonderful sight that very morning he had snatched at the money forthwith and had been knocked headlong and when he got to his feet the butterfly money had vanished our mariner was in the mood to believe anything he declared but that was a bit too stiff afterwards however he began to think things over the story of the flying money was true and all about that neighbourhood even from the august london and country banking company from the tills of shops and inns doors standing that sunny weather entirely open money had been quietly and dexterously making off that day in handfuls and rouleaux floating quietly along by walls and shady places dodging quickly from the approaching eyes of men and it had though no man had traced it invariably ended its mysterious flight in the pocket of that agitated gentleman in the obsolete silk hat sitting outside the little inn on the outskirts of port stowe it was ten days after and indeed only when the burdock story was already old that the mariner collated these facts and began to understand how near he had been to the wonderful invisible man chapter fifteen the man who was running in the early evening time dr kemp was sitting in his study in the belvedere on the hill overlooking burdock it was a pleasant little room with three windows north west and south and bookshelves covered with books and scientific publications and a broad writing table and underneath the north window a microscope glass slips minute instruments some cultures and scattered bottles of reagents dr kemp's solar lamp was lit albeit the sky was still bright with the sunset light and his blinds were up because there was no offence of peering outsiders to require them pulled down dr kemp was a tall and slender young man with flaxen hair and a moustache almost white and the work he was upon would earn him he hoped the fellowship of the royal society so highly did he think of it and his eye presently wandering from his work caught the sunset blazing at the back of the hill that is over against his own for a minute perhaps he sat pen in mouth admiring the rich golden colour above the crest and then his attention was attracted by the little figure of a man inky black running over the hill-brow towards him he was a shortish little man and he wore a high hat and he was running so fast that his legs verily twinkled another of those fools said dr kemp like that ass who ran into me this morning around a corner with visible man coming sir I can't imagine what possesses people. One might think we were in the thirteenth century. He got up, went to the window, and stared at the dusky hillside and the dark little figure tearing down it. He seemed in a confounded hurry, said Dr. Kemp. But he doesn't seem to be getting on. If his pockets were full of lead, he couldn't run heavier. Spurted, sir, said Dr. Kemp. In another moment, the hire of the villas that had clambered up the hill from Burdock had occluded the running figure. He was visible again for a moment, and again, and then again, 
three times between the three detached houses that came next, and then the terrace hid him. Asses, said Dr. Kemp, swinging around on his heel and walking back to his writing table. But those who saw the fugitive nearer, and perceived the abject terror on his perspiring face, being themselves in the open roadway, did not share in the doctor's contempt. The man pounded, and as he ran he chinked like a well-filled purse that is tossed to and fro. He looked neither to the right nor the left, but his dilated eyes stared straight downhill to where the lamps were being lit and the people were crowded in the street. And his ill-shaped mouth fell apart, and a glary foam lay on his lips, and his breath came hoarse and noisy. All he passed stopped and began staring up the road and down, and interrogating one another with an inkling of discomfort for the reason of his haste. And then presently, far up the hill, a dog playing in the road yelped and ran under a gate, and as they still wondered something, a wind, a pad, 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 a sound like a panting breathing, rushed by. People screamed. People sprang off the pavement. It passed in shouts. It passed by instinct down the hill. They were shouting in the street before Marvel was halfway there. They were bolting into houses and slamming the doors behind them. And with the news, he heard it and made one last desperate spurt. Fear came striding by, rushed ahead of him, and in a moment had seized the town. The invisible man is coming, the invisible man.